equal to this, the 10th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? Can I also indicate that we've received apologies from Angus MacDonald this morning? So the first petition for consideration is Petition 1545 by Anne Maxwell on behalf of Muir Maxwell Trust on residential care provision for the severely learning disabled. We last considered this petition at our meeting on 15th March and agreed to invite the petitioner to make a written submission and to write to the Scottish Learning Disabilities Observatory to ask for information about its work to address the data visibility of people with learning disabilities in Scotland. The observatory submission provides a detailed outline of its work programme, which is included in our meetings papers. The petitioner's written submission expresses concern that there are limited references in the work programme to epilepsy, despite 60% of people with profound learning disabilities having this condition. The petitioner is of the view that residential care would resolve many of the issues the observatory is currently researching and suggests that the financial consequence of inadequate care for the profound learning disabled should be a focus of the observatory's work. And I wonder if members have any comments. focus you know on the fact that the petitioner is saying that not enough emphasis has been put on the you know epilepsy um, question and just some of the points that they raise about um, you know what the, the work being undertaken by the observatory I think we need to tease out a wee bit more um, just to find out in detail what's what's been done yeah. um, I mean I was quite struck by the argument because you can see that over time and quite rightly the idea that if you had a learning disability, you went into long-term care. Um, Paula quite rightly changed, and I think it's been a massive benefit to mm -hmm. people who have been able to live in the community, work in the community, achieve their potential. But it almost feels as if, because of that policy, it's as if it's not appropriate to have residential care in yeah, certain circumstances. Far, yeah. mm -hmm. And that, you know, while you wouldn't want the, the general rule to be that, that they, I think they make quite a strong case for... A community where people can be supported and, the, and resources and, and support can be yeah. brought round about them. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I think I agree with you on this whole question about exploring further. Are they looking at the question of epilepsy and if and why not? That would be one yeah. element. Yeah. Brian, I was actually going to say some, something similar. Uh, convener, I was going to say that you know, it, 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 uh, whether or not the pendulum swung too far the other way, mm -hmm. uh, and the, and that the 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 option of um, Residential care uh, is, is now, you know, limited. Um, so I think that's something that, that certainly worth worth exploring. And I also want to look at maybe the financial consequences sure. of of, uh, of that sort of. Uh, I, I, I don't want to say inadequate care, but uh, but, for, for, but uh, the, the options one against the other, mm -hmm. what, what the financial uh, um, consequences of, of one against the other, are perhaps. Yeah, I think the petitioner does make the case that there are financial consequences of not perhaps but making this provision available in certain circumstances because further along the line there are consequences for the individual and I think that would be something we could look at so would we agree then that we want to exp sorry could I, could I just add on to that um, uh, there was a point here made about the um, Scottish Government measuring the demand for long term residential care um, based on the current number of children and young people in residential care and they make the point that it's flawed way of measuring demand and fails to capture the true need that currently exists in Scotland. I wondered if that was something, the, the methodology of calculating the number of um, people currently taking up residential care uh, places, is that affecting um, that this as well? Yeah. If, the, if the facility's not available then you're you're, you're ignoring demand in a sense, or you're not kind of searching it out, I suppose. So are we agreed then that we would um, ask the Scottish Learning Disabilities Observatory about its work in relation to links with profound learning disabilities and epilepsy, and to look at this whole question of the financial consequence of what's seen as, um, if not inadequate, inappropriate perhaps, okay. or, you know, it's not kind of totally supporting a person. Is that agreed? OK, in that case, if we can move on, thank you for that, to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1591 by Katrina MacDonald on behalf of SOS NHS on major redesign of healthcare services in Skye, Loch Alsh and South West Ross. Rhoda Grant, MSP, Kate Forbes, MSP and Edward Mountain, MSP, 
who have attended previous meetings at which we have considered this petition are not able to attend today, but I have provided some comments to which I will refer shortly. We previously agreed to defer further consideration of this petition until the external view by Sir Lewis Ritchie on out-of-hours urgent care and minor injury clinical services had reported. That report was published in May and a full copy is included in our meetings papers. The clerk's note identifies the theme and key messages within the report about the need for NHS Highland and the local communities to work together, which has been regularly highlighted during our consideration of this petition. The petitioners have provided a written submission in which they indicate a willingness to engage in co-production with NHS Highland and others to help to deliver some of the key recommendations in Sir Lewis Ritchie's report. Rhoda Grant has indicated that she would like the petition to remain open until the six-month review of the key themes identified in Sir Lewis Ritchie's report has been completed. Edward Mountain notes that this is a long-standing petition of great importance to the people of Skye and Wester Ross, which came about as a result of the actions of NHS Highland, which he says were far from inclusive. He considers that Sir Lewis Ritchie's review has been a significant step forward and has managed to reunite the majority of the community. He adds, and I quote, there, however, remains a genuine fear that NHS Highland, although accepting the report, will revert back to their original position and will not implement all the findings. I have been asked by many to speak to this petition and to ask the committee to keep the petition open for a further six months. While I know the com committee may feel the matter has been dealt with, it would give my constituents confidence in the political system to know that it was not closed. And Kate Forward, Forbes has indicated, and I quote, I offer my apologies to the convener and to constituents watching at home for being unable to be here in person. We have made huge progress since the last meeting, with Professor Sir Lewis Rich's report stating unequivocally that Portree Hospital should remain open with resilient 24-7 emergency care and beds provided in the north end of Skye. The priority now is to ensure this happens. Until it is implemented in full, I would ask the committee to keep the petition open. And I wonder if members have any comments. Brian? Yeah, I think um, I, I think having having uh, uh, in my own constituency work done a few uh, uh, had a few constituents where where there was that sort of a review and recommendations done and then them not necessarily being implemented in full uh, or no, no need for them to be implemented in full. I'm I'm a, I'm inclined to agree with with, uh, with with the colleagues' written submission that uh, for fullness. We should leave this petition open for six months and revisit to check against uh, against the recommendations and the recommendations have been implemented. So, my, my opinion is we, we we go with that and leave it open for the six months. Okay. Any other views? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's clear that you know the decision has been made on the, on the restructuring and, and that's not going to change. So, you know, Edward Mountain's right. It, it's it's uh, it has been um, dealt with, but I think and it's good that. Progress has been made um, now on the collaboration between NHS Highland and the community. That's really good news. But I, I agree with, with, with Brian. I think we should keep it open for six months until Sir Lewis Ritchie can come back and just uh, update us with progress in that report. I think it's su been such an important petition and um, I think another six months would do it justice. Okay. Rachel? I agree, convener. I think that it would give us uh, reassurance um, that significant progress was being made um, with, with this review, and uh, I, I would agree with the committee that we keep it open for another six months. I wonder if we should um, ask the Scottish Government to provide its views on the findings of the review, um, particularly with how, the, with regard to the recommendation, it should seek regular and robust assurance that satisfactory progress is being made. Perhaps ask the Scottish Government how they're intending to do that. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think okay. In that case, we're agreeing to. Um, um, as you know, been identified to keep the, the petition open for a, a further six months, not give us an idea of whether the um, Sir Lewis Ritchie's um, review is is being attended to by the, the health board. Okay, in that case, if we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1627 by Annette McKenzie. At our meeting on 29th of March, we discussed a suggestion made by the petitioner to introduce the use of written consent forms for young people who have been prescribed antidepressants and asked the Minister for Mental Health for a view on this suggestion. The Minister of the, is of the view that the introduction of written consent forms would undermine the whole concept of capacity and confidentiality and could be considered discriminatory towards young people as well as creating inequity between mental and physical health. 
Members will recall at our meeting in March that we reflected on the outcome of a survey conducted by the Scottish Association for Mental Health in 2014, which found that GPs would like more information about non-pharmaceutical treatment options for common mental health problems, and almost half of GPs are not aware of, or not sure if they are aware of, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network guideline on non-pharmaceutical treatments for depression. We therefore ask the Minister for Mental Health to reflect on the findings of this survey and how it intends to promote the signed guideline to all GP practice in Scotland. In a written submission, the Minister states that the Scottish Government is currently working with the Royal College of GPs, the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the British Medical Association to provide information for GPs on training and guidance on non-pharmaceutical treatment options for common mental health problems. Excuse me and to promote the relevant sign guidelines. This information is expected to be sent to GPs by the end of June. At our meeting in March, we agreed to ask for information about the work of the Youth Commission, led by Young Scott, to explore the potential for people aged 18 to 25 to continue their care within child and adolescent mental health services. We also agreed to ask Healthy Care Improvement Scotland about its work to improve child and adolescent mental health services redesign with individual NHS boards. Responses have been received and this information is set out in our meeting papers. Since our meeting in March, members will recall that we also considered this petition in private on the 10th of May to reflect on all of the evidence we have received to date. And I wonder if members have any comments. Bye. Um, I think it's fair to say this, is, this, this petition has exercised this, uh, this committee um, probably more than, more than most and affected us more than most, I think it's a hugely uh, important uh, uh, petition and and, uh, and we do uh, you know we're all along recognizing the tension between you know confidentiality uh, and also you know, uh, exploring you know uh, somebody with mental health presenting with mental health issues capacity to um, uh, administer uh, administer medication especially uh, in under 18s and uh, I think it's something I've wrestled with this particular one a lot um, I think I, I indicated to you before that in the Health and Support Committee we've, we've been doing some work, work around this as well. And I think it opens up a whole can of worms for me. And I think what would be really interesting for me would be to hold some sort of inquiry uh, with and ask uh, young people how they access mental health services, what they, f what they feel mental health services should, should look like. Um, I, said, I, I happened to be with a, a group on Monday um, uh, uh, who had uh, uh, you know, poor mental health and uh, it was quite eye-opening as to their understanding of what uh, mental health services should look like, their interaction and various various exper different, exper different experiences with, uh, uh, with GPs and with mental health services. Um, and that is something I think that... Uh, would hugely benefit um, uh, this, this Parliament's understanding of how mental health services are currently being accessed. So I, I, I would suggest that we, we, we look at maybe um, have, holding an inquiry okay. in, 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 into the, how they access mental health services. I mean, I have to say I was quite disappointed in the Minister's response and the whole question of written consent because, you know, it's not a question of we're discriminating, is we're wrestling with a, with a dilemma and a major problem. I think there's an issue about being confident. I mean, at my understanding, best practice is you don't offer um, medication in first instance unless there's a crisis. But, you know, the default position was that you would look to other therapies first. And I am interested, perhaps, through the inquiry and establishing whether GPs are under such pressure that they don't have the time to actually go through that and it, they, they perhaps end up feeling the need to prescribe rather than anything else. And I also think that what would be routinely regarded as a thing to say to a person with a physical condition, make sure you get support from home. If you've had a terrible diagnosis of a cancer, presumably you would be encouraged to tell your family, whereas somehow there seems to be an inhibition in this regard because it's mental health. We're almost tipping it in the other direction. Um, so I think the, I'm very... I think everybody's alive to just how serious this is for families and impact it has where you know, there are, are tragic circumstances involved. And I think perhaps that ensuring perhaps that young people themselves are part of that conversation would be very interesting. Rona? I totally agree. I think 
it's such a significant issue um, and it, it's, it is complex. Um, I mean, I find it hard, that the whole system hard to understand when trying to help constituents or families who come to you with problems um, just to navigate the system and to signpost them in the right direction. It really is difficult. So I think an inquiry to, to get these things discussed and, and the young people involved as well would, would definitely is definitely necessary because um, the, the, the process for helping young people with mental health issues is not easy. It's difficult. So. Okay. Rachel? Um, would be that it, it's a long time to wait um, to... Uh, I see that the Commission are going to intend to report the findings to the Minister, Scottish Government, in March 2019. It's a long time to wait, in my mind, because there are people out there at the moment um, ne needing treatment and... Um, I, I just think if there's any way of speeding this up, it would be fantastic. Why does it have to be such a long process? Currently, there are complicated pathways um, to uh, receiving the right treatment. And I think um, the point about helping our constituents is, is really key here because GPs currently use CAMS, the CAMS service. Um, are they using that to, um, you know, the best effect, you know, I think this is a really, really important subject, and I just think that if we could do anything to speed it up, I would be behind that. Okay, Brian. And just in mentioning Cam's here, and understanding that the, the, the that 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 change between uh, youth and uh, adult services uh, also has been highlighted as as a major issue. And I think you know the, the petitioner's daughter sits in that in, in that age group, and. Uh, I think as part of this, uh, I, I would really like to look at how how that system that that, that system of changing from child, childhood uh, treatment to uh, adult treatment uh, is, is delivered. I think that's one of the things the Commission in particular is looking at, isn't it? That, um, can I suggest then that we agree that we would wish to hold an inquiry on how young people can access mental health services and treatments? And we would um, ask the clerks to produce a, a paper for the future, looking at what that inquiry might look like and what kind of the timescales for that would be. And we'll be agreeing to do that, but of scoping work in private at a future meeting. Yes, That's agreed. agreed. Okay, in that case, if we can move on. The next petition for consideration is Petition 1631 by Maureen McVeigh on child welfare hearings. At our last consideration of this petition in March, we considered a suggestion made by the petitioner to use fixed specialist family law courts for child welfare hearings and sought the Scottish Government's view in relation to this suggestion. The Government highlights that the Lord President has the powers to determine that family cases be heard by specialist family sheriffs, but advises that a number of matters would need to be considered before making this decision, as outlined in our meetings papers. In her written submission, the petitioner asks whether the there are criteria for the Lord President to determine when and in what child contact cases this happens. Members will recall at our last consideration of this petition, we also considered a recommendation made to the Scottish Civil Justice Council from independent research he had commissioned to use note sheets to ensure information flowed between sheriffs in situations where scheduling meant the same sheriff was not able to remain with the case. We therefore agree to write to charities providing advocacy and support to children for their views on the current practice of recording discussions at child welfare hearings. The Scottish Child Law Centre is supportive of the idea of note sheets, stating that they would improve the quality of decision making, promote and safeguard the best interest of the child. However, they also highlight that note sheets should only be used to facilitate information flow between sheriffs and should not compromise judicial impartiality. In striking the appropriate balance between recording discussions at child welfare hearings without it being overly burdensome, the Law Centre suggests that it would improve the child welfare hearing process for sheriffs to provide a written account on the basis on which their decision in a child welfare hearing in the form of a child welfare hearing decision note. The petitioner is supportive of this suggestion. Members may also wish to note that there are currently two consultations underway relevant to this petition. The first is a consultation by the Scottish Civil Justice Council on a report by a subcommittee on case management of family actions. The second is a consultation by the Scottish Government on a review of Part 1 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995. Both consultations close in August 2018. And I wonder if members have any comments on what we should now do with this petition. Rona? I think we should... Um I don't think we should defer it um, until the 
the close of the consultation by the Scottish Civil Justice Council because I think there's things we could do now. Um, I'd like to you know see as soon as possible uh, you know some positive outcome from this petition. Um, I think the the question on the criteria of you know whether or not a case is heard in a family court and what what's used to determine that and child contact. We need some. Um, we need some detail from the Lord President's office, so I think we should ask what criteria they are using in, in this instance, because it's not clear. Um, and we should also, I think the the, um, the Scottish Law Centre's support for notes was interesting, really interesting, and could be a positive development, so I think we should ask the government to respond to that. Okay. Anything else? I agree with that. I, yeah. I mean, I thought it was quite odd, this idea that... Um, that somehow recording or having a note of a discussion was going to somehow inhibit judicial impartiality at a later stage. I thought in well, in any walk of life you have a set of notes about a case and you follow it through. And I think the point in their very original petition was that people shouldn't have to keep retelling the story or misrepresentation of what was discussed previously. And so that's why it's taking such a long time mm -hmm. to get through some of these yeah. cases. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we are agreeing that we would want, that, that as, as Ron has indicated, uh, there are issues that we could pursue just now about how it's determined what family cases are heard in the family courts um, and you know this suggestion about the child welfare hearing decision note. I'm trying to get the Scottish Government to respond to that. So that's agreed. Yes. Okay. In that case, I'm going to suspend briefly before we take the next petition. can call the meeting back to order um, and move to our next agenda item. So our first new petition for consideration today is Petition 1690 by Emma Shorter on behalf of ME Action in Scotland. Can I welcome Ben McPherson and Mark Ruskell, MSP, um, to the table for this petition. 
I should also indicate that Alec Rowley, MSP, has expressed an interest in issues highlighted in the petition, which were highlighted to him by a constituent, and he has indicated to be interested in following the deliberations of the committee in regard to this petition. We will take evidence in this petition from Emma Shorter and her mother, Janet Sylvester. Emma and Janet are both volunteers with ME Action in Scotland. Also attending is Professor Chris Ponting, Chair of Medical Bioinformatics at Edinburgh University and Deputy Chair of the UK CFS ME Research Collaborative. Can I welcome to you all and thank you for attending this morning. You have got the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes and after that the committee will ask a few questions in order to help inform our consideration of the petition. So I want to just welcome and and your own time. Oh, um, thank you for this opportunity to give evidence today. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I just want to start by saying that if I have um, difficulty speaking or trouble with comprehension or anything like that, I'll just deteriorate until I have trouble moving or speaking. So I've organised to do a timeout sign and my dad will just leave. Um, I apologise and I'm sure Chris and Janet will be able to answer any questions. Okay. Um, so our petition is about myalgic encephalitis in Scotland. There are over 20,000 people with this disease in Scotland. It turns fit and active people into ghosts. It becomes, activity becomes not running and climbing, but trying to wash your hair or make a cup of tea. I know teachers who can't teach, children who can't play, and parents who can no longer hold their children. Um, some patients are too ill to move or speak at all, and uh, I have a friend who's been bedbound for over 25 years. So I became, I got ME um, over five years ago when I was in my first year at St Andrews University. And I went from hill walking and hockey playing to struggling to move my hand to lift a glass of water. I was lucky in that I was diagnosed really quickly and I saw a doctor who told me he was one of the most knowledgeable doctors in Scotland. There had been recent evidence that cognitive behavioural therapy and graded exercise therapy could help any patients recover. A new clinic had just opened up in Edinburgh and I would be referred there right away. He said, you, most patients get better in two years and the ones who don't take the illness on as their personalities. So my parents and I, we couldn't look anything up on the internet or join any support groups or meet any patients because that could maintain the disease. So I started at the clinic and it started off really helpful. It was meditation and rest. And then it turned into, if you're happy, you won't get better. And you have to focus on nutrition and sleep, but you can't focus too much on it or you won't get better. And all the symptoms were a manifestation of your emotions. And you have to trust the therapist over your own body. I had to walk and you had to increase walking by 10% each week. And as I began to get sicker and sicker, I was told, uh, this is the moment where you push through and you get better. I started the clinic being able to walk about four minutes each day. Um, I ended and I needed a, a wheelchair. I went back to my physio, I went back to my doctor, and they said, congratulations, uh, we're so glad we helped you recover. There was, there is no other treatment. And when I said, I appreciate your help, but I've deteriorated during this treatment. The response from my consultant was, well, did you ever think that you just didn't try hard enough? 
and he referred me back to the clinic. We now have, well, there is objective evidence of abnormalities in ME patients from immune, nervous, endocrine, and crucially, energy metabolic systems. Some researchers actually use exercise as a way to aggravate symptoms in order to study the disease. It's so distinct that it was recommended, it was named systemic exercise intolerance disease. CBT get remains the only recommended treatment for patients in Scotland. And that's why we're here today to ask for these therapies to be removed. Uh, but we're also asking for more. We're asking for care, because there's only one specialist ME, a nurse in Fife. And if ME patients are given appropriate advice and diagnosis, it may stop deterioration and give us the best chance of improvement. We're asking for education of healthcare professionals, because becoming unwell is compounded by this disbelief and dismissiveness we face by doctors. And it's unfair to expect them to treat us without up-to-date training. The urgency of this can be seen in the treatment of children. In a UK survey last year, a fifth of patients reported child protection referrals being made against them. ME is the main term of long-term sickness absence from school. But because healthcare professionals don't understand how children can remain so sick for so long, they start blaming the parents. And this is why we need to review the curriculum and update training materials. And finally, uh, biomedical research. Because for some of us, there is no future without it. I know the Scottish government has recently given 15,000 pounds a year for three years. And this is great, but I hope it is just a start. ME research has been underfunded worldwide for decades, and we have world-class researchers here in Scotland, like Professor Ponting, willing to study us. If Scotland invests in biomedical research and creates a centre for ME, we will not only be changing the lives of patients in Scotland, but we would be leading the change internationally. Uh, thank you for seeing us today. Thank you, thank you very much for that. You, and if I start the question and then we can um, move on. You, obviously, you've already said that the first action identified in your petition summary is investment in biomedical research. And in your background information, consider that the funding should be proportional to disease burden. And again, you've referred to this, but we understand that the Chief Scientist scientist office has announced funding of up to 90,000 over three years towards a PhD studentship in this area to be led by Professor Ponting. And I wonder um, whether you consider that level of investment is proportional to disease burden? Thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful indeed for the £15,000 a year that is going to be put forward put for three years for this PhD studentship. The the half of the money is going to come from charity. Um, and it will allow us to, to perform our first experiments uh, on ME. However, there are, as Emma said, over 20,000 people living uh, with ME in, in Scotland. Um, and so therefore, the amount of funding is a, a, about one pound per person per year for three years. Um, I don't think that is proportionate. For example, it is at least as disabling a disease as multiple sclerosis, but it receives per person less than 20 times the amount of funding that multiple sclerosis receives. People with ME, as Emma have described, have a very low quality of life um, compared to any with other disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, or even congestive heart failure. People who are most severely affected get the least care and the least attention, the least funding. That marks out ME as different from anything else. Do you have an explanation for why that is? We don't know what the causes are. We need to find out. There is no funding that comes into what the causes are because we don't yet have hypotheses. And without hypotheses, the funders uh, aren't persuaded of the argument. 
Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Rona Mackay. Yeah, um, thank you and good morning. Um, Emma, you've indicated that you contacted the Health Minister or the Health Minister has been contacted um, on this issue. And um, did you raise the subject of a centre of excellence with with her at that time? Yes, I actually uh, con sorry, I contacted the Health Minister on Emma's behalf and uh, we didn't raise the subject of the Centre for Excellence. We were talking then about specialist uh, support for patients and the need for investment in research, but not specifically looking at the Centre for Excellence. Okay, and, and if a Centre of Excellence was to happen, what, what would you, you know, what, give us an idea of what you'd like to see that do. <laughs> Can you answer that, Chris? I think we need to generate the hypotheses that will be the starting, will, will fire the starting gun on, on research. Um, that means that we need to biobank people there are DNA, there are biosamples. From that, we can determine what are the genetic contributions. We know there are genetic contributions. It's a real genetic illness. Um, and we need to have experimental medicine programs um, using the uh, substantial enthusiasm that there is in Scotland from people with ME to contribute to science. And then we need to be innovative in terms of how we do the science, including using wearables, accelerometers from phones to allow us to measure how well people, poorly people, are doing over the day. Can I, can I just ask you, um, you know, from what Emma was saying, and, and uh, is it your impression that clinicians um, sort of don't agree? Is there, is there mixed um, opinions on diagnosis and on treatment is, is, is that the general sit situation just now that there's no sort of common framework or agreement on either diagnosis and treat or treatment um, actually there was recently a what's it called <laughs> meeting of clinic of international experts for care in America and they came with a um an agreement they agreed on diagnosis and care and they are planning to uh, publish a paper I think later this year so I'm just wondering how you know how that can be done without the appropriate research having been done that you're talking about you know how can how can it be agreed when when really um so much is still to be to be learned and and, and should have been by now in my yeah. opinion yeah yeah yes, I think uh, I think the issue here is that they're they're looking at how to best support people with ME and to give them the uh, treatment to deal deal with the disease rather than uh, a anything approaching a cure for it. Oh, um, it's, it's management. It's managing management, the disease, yeah. not treatment, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I meant. Apologies. Yeah. Okay, okay. that's fine. Understanding of the best practice in management, mm. um, which is being led from the state, that we need to roll out in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gavina, and good morning, and, and thank you for bringing uh, bringing this to the Petitions Committee. And you've provided references to a range of studies uh, within your end notes uh, of the petition, and you also referred to the PACE trial. Uh, given that one would expect research to inform uh, training and education, can you outline briefly what you consider to be the key considerations when undertaking research or evaluating studies? Do you want to start, or shall I? Yeah, so. Um, the, the PACE trial, I think most people would now agree, um, does not demonstrate that for the majority of people with ME that there is benefit from the two uh, treatments, CBT and graded exercise therapy. That trial was not done blinded. It's very difficult to do a blinded trial. I understand that. Um, but one must understand the limitations of an unblinded trial. Um, and the modest effects that were seen from that trial could be, I'm not saying that they are, but they could have come about because of the unblinded nature of the trial. And, and the second point in your petition summary calls for a review to ensure healthcare professionals' training and education materials reflect the late, latest scientific evidence. What well, if you could expand on this? Uh, for example, is, uh, is there international evidence uh, that you're aware of that is not being considered or acknowledged uh, within Scotland? So I can. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> yes, I suppose. Uh, that I'm not sure. <laughs> the there is it seems to be. Are, are, are you? Do you mean about care or do, like management of the disease, or do you mean about research or about? Care? Probably both, actually. I think that uh, from, from your submission, obviously, you're, you're saying that the care of those with anemia is not adequate. Uh -huh. Also, what we're hearing as well is that uh, research is very much in its infancy. Uh, um, <coughs> yes. For example, there is the work of um, a doctor at the University of Pacific, Dr. Van Ness, and he's shown an abnormally early transition to anaer anaerobic metabolism. And he's worked out a system of heart rate monitoring, which it's not been, it gives us a best practice to try and stay within our kind of energy boundaries and not become more severely unwell. Um, so that's kind of more recent. And there's a lot, um, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, I brought some of the biomedical research highlights, uh, but I think Chris will probably be able to go into them more. But there are, although there's not that much research, there is some like that, which um, does give us, indicates uh, ways we could be managing the disease. And um, yes, sorry, does that answer your question or? I'm, I'm really quite I'm just, I'm interested in this, uh, this idea of, of it, it um, impacting anaerobic energy system uh, and how that impacts on or quality of life as well. So, just, just for my clarity, um, what is, is, is the uh, research suggesting that uh, the sort of early tap into that anaerobic energy system is, is is what's detracting from from your own um, ability to to move? Okay. Um, so there is evidence of metabolic dysfunction um, involving the mitochondrion, for example. Um, these are observational studies. They don't say that they are directly a, a cause of disease. They could be a consequence. We need to understand that it could be one or the other, so we don't know. Um, I think the most impressive research, which is yet to be published, I know that, but it's still impressive, that there is a, uh, an immune signature of ME. Um, so that if, and have people, Mark Davis and Stanford University have done this, they have demonstrated that they can distinguish between healthy controls and people with ME by their T cells and their clonal expansion. And to me, that means that there is a, an immune component to this uh, disorder. Um, and we know that there are many ways in which immune dysfunction can affect overall wellness and, um, and energy levels. I'm sorry, just, and, and, and you mentioned earlier on that, that uh, you think that, that, that it tackles or attacks the, the endocrine system as well. Is, is that fair to say? Um, I base what I know on evidence um, and strong evidence, and I don't think we have that evidence today, but I'd be very happy to see if there were to be any. Okay. Um, I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, um, Good morning, everyone. Um, you spoke, Emma, uh, about the education of um, health care professionals, and um, in the background information it states that the care is the responsibility of GPs who do not receive training into how best to diagnose and treat ME, and are often badly misinformed um, about the disease. And this also seems to have um, been reflected in evidence given to the Health and Sport Committee uh, last November, when the committee heard that majority of GPs were not aware of the Scottish Good Practice Statement on ME-CFS. I just wondered what your thoughts are on, on that and if you can expand. Um, sorry, my thoughts on, uh, on how bad it is? Or well, <laughs> well, the fact that um, care is responsibility for GPs who do not receive training into how best to diagnose and, and treat ME and that the Health and Sport Committee were not, um, that GPs, they found that GPs were not aware of the Scottish Good um, practice statement on MECFS. Yeah, well, I, uh, I'm not sure if you're asking for Emma's personal experience no. or, or just as well in general. Sure. Yes, yes. I'll open um, it up. And anecdotally, um, and obviously I've been with Emma in appointments uh, and heard from many other people with ME that um, their doctors simply are not aware of of, of what the 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 um, best way of, of supporting people with ME, and indeed many of them still have a, a, a 
belief that it's a, a disease, a psychological illness, that uh, it doesn't have a physical um, basis to it. Um, and, and the Action for ME study that you mentioned there, um, that the 30, only 30% 30 of GPs said they were aware of the Scottish Good Practice Statement, and only half of those uh, actually said that they used it. So you can see how little, little used it is. Um, I think there is a real issue, not just with GPs, but with other healthcare professionals in their understanding of the disease and, and the way in which they can best support people. Chris, did you A doctor I talked to last week who was educated in Scotland told me that his training involved 15 minutes of ME training uh, as opposed to two days on multiple sclerosis. So, um, would you recommend that um, it's something that is is um, g given further consideration? Of course, I mean, I presume that's that's what you're backing. But how, how does how do you go about that? We're uh, uh, we're still sort of working on on what the best thing to do is. But uh, at the moment, I, th I think we'd ask the Scottish government to ask the um, colleges, the Royal, Royal Colleges of, of Medicine, to review the treatment of. of of how they deal with ME in the curricula, um, and for the NHS Education Scotland, the Specialist Health Board, to uh, explain uh, the results of a recent review that they've had carried out into uh, the materials into adult ME, um, and describe their approach to ME, which is um, uh, perhaps slightly different from the approach that we would like to see them take. So your ultimate objective would be to raise awareness um, amongst um, GP and GPs and so that they would use that uh, Scottish Good Practice Statement and, and, and just highlight awareness, really, of the condition. Yes, I think there are also separate issues around the Scottish Good Practice Statement. Um, as you're probably aware, most diseases have a, a sign um, guidelines um, and you'll see in the recommendations on the from from 2010 from the needs assessment recommendations that uh, at that stage it wasn't uh, believed that there was enough evidence to support producing a sign uh, guideline for me um, we haven't agreed this yet but I, I think the pro there may be now enough evidence to produce those guidelines and the Scottish good practice statement for CFS me, ME is so rare it's not surprising that, that health professionals haven't heard of them. You know, the very few Scottish good practice statements out there to be referred to by health professionals. So there's something around that whole awareness of, 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 of how how G, GPs and other health professionals are made aware of of diseases like ME that ME needs to to be much more on the the front line. Um, just on a supplementary there, that the, the statement was supported by a patient guide, and I just. I um, wondered if you had any comments about that guide itself. No, I don't think so. Okay. No, we could okay. come back to you on that, though, if that yeah. would be useful. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, you're referring there about sign guidance and so on. Our briefing refers to the NICE guidance, which has currently been updated and due to be published in 2020. I wonder what your views are on the NICE guideline as it currently stands. Um, it's not fit for purpose. Um, and are you aware of any engagement or information gathering being undertaken by NICE to inform its updated guidance? I mean, guidelines, sorry, because obviously if you think the one's not fit for purpose, are they speaking to the right people um, about um, the, in updating it? And if so, if you had the opportunity to contribute to that, for example, by consultation, um, and according to our briefing, the Scottish Government has indicated that it does not intend to review the Scottish Good Practice Statement, which we've heard about, until the updated NICE guidance is published. And I wonder if I can ask for your thoughts on that. I think um, the first point was consulted whether we've been consulted. Um, yes, they're um, consulting patient groups, including ME Action. So because we're part of a UK-wide um, group, we have two volunteers going along. Um, I think their, their feedback to us uh, was uh, listened, but were we heard? They were taking on the views. They were they were allowing views to be aired, um, but with the with the guidelines changed. But they are holding consultations. They are um, inviting comments and holding meetings with patients and healthcare professionals. Um, and I think there's some concerns about the the harm that the guide the nice guidelines are like in their current um, state. And I think 
I think all charities, um, certainly ME Action UK, are calling for um, CBT get to be removed as soon as possible before before 2020. So your argument would be that the, the good practice statement has to be looked at while this is in progress rather than at the end of it? Yes, I also think we have the opportunity now to change it. We have the, the evidence now and uh, we, we have the chance now to stop other people being harmed by this. So um, I think it should be changed as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Sorry. Sorry, there is, there is a, a precedent for this in the sense that the Scottish good practice statement was... Um, produced, I think, just after the NICE guidelines, but actually developed, uh, it's considered by, by many patients as, as better than the NICE guidelines because yeah. they, they took it, they, 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 didn't, they didn't take the NICE guidelines and, and entirely as the recommendations as, as set. They actually looked at them and, and reviewed them effectively, much more effectively than NICE guidelines. Okay, thanks very much for that. Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Um, Emma, you spoke earlier about... Um, graded exercise therapy and, and what that entailed. I wonder if I could ask you a wee bit about uh, cognitive behaviour therapy and, and why you th why that's harmful. Um, it's not definitely not all cognitive behavioural therapy. It's, I think, people with ME and anyone with a chronic long-term illness can really benefit from psychological support. Um, it's, I think it's called directive cognitive behavioural therapy and it's about, sort of, um, it's based on the idea that ME is caused by fear of exercise and deconditioning. So it's quite, um, my personal view is it's quite manipulative. Um, and I, I don't think we should be, uh, I, I think cognitive behavioural therapy for, to support patients is fine, but cognitive behavioural therapy on the basis that, you know, they're just afraid to do anything and to persuade them to, to exercise more is, uh, can be harmful. And is that sort of currently... What happens in terms of if you go to one of these sessions, that's pretty much what, what you're being told with the CBT. It's that, well, you know, it's really in your mind that you don't like exercise. Um, is that kind of what's been happening at the moment? It's not explicitly like that. Um, it's not because the point is you, <laughs> the point is that um, you, uh, is that the, the healthcare professional, uh, well, this is this is what believes or, or has to gain your trust to act, that they, they believe you're sick, mm -hmm. um, and it turns into because I currently have I've had therapy which is supportive and it's about managing your symptoms, and the CBT was kind of like um, just everything coming back to something you were doing, um, and everything coming back to sort of blaming you for for the disease. Mm -hmm. um, which is not helpful. Which it wasn't helpful, though. It did make me think I was going crazy. Um, I think that's, you know, you just think I, I must be, what the therapist is, is saying and what I'm experiencing is so different. Um, and, yeah. And do most patients get, get that? that um, most patients in England get that. The provision in Scotland is, it depends on the therapist. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you, you could get one that was, that was supportive or you could get yeah. one that really followed this okay. so um okay. yeah yeah that's great thank you thank okay. you uh, brian whittle uh, thank you Gimia. our briefing refers to healthcare needs assessment of services for people living with me uh, cfs undertaken by the scottish public health network which came up with uh, 26 recommendations which which hopefully you're familiar with so if i could ask you which of those recommendations you would consider to be priorities or if there's anything missing uh, from that list of recommendations <laughs> to be honest, they, they all look like priorities for us, but we would need to, I think, probably look at the, the list in a bit more detail and come back to you on that. Um, they, they covered, as you can see, a lot of what we're, uh, what Emma's bringing to the committee today. Um, and uh, I suppose our question is, what, what happened? <laughs> Why would, they've not been implemented, and, and we don't know where that went in 2010. Um, but could, could we come back to you as to what the priorities would That'd be? That would be really you? helpful. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. And also, if I, if I, if I, the concern that's been identified in those recommendations is that the recommendations can be made, but then do not get taken forward, as you've just uh, alluded to. And I wonder if you could outline how many of those uh, recommendations made in the healthcare assessment either come into effect or are being actively progressed. And presumably, you would like to, to, to come back to us Look on that, that one. So yeah. I just wanted to add that in, if I could, yeah, uh, for sure. fullness. Thank you.
Okay, Rachel. Let's go back to the um, the treatment, the CBT treatment. We had a briefing actually in this morning um, that talked about the um, that the, it's not um, sci scientifically sound. I just wondered if Professor Chris Point Pointing would be able to comment on um, you know why that is the case um, and why that um, the NHS recommended therapies for um, ME patients in Scotland um, implies that Scottish Government supports the CBT uh, model of ME. I think this comes back to the question about the PACE trial, which um, was investigating the uh, benefit or otherwise of CBT and GT uh, on patients. Um, and so it comes back to this question as to whether there was uh, benefit for most people from that trial or evidence for benefit for most people and there wasn't. Um, there appeared to be benefit for some. A reanalysis of that indicates that that effect was lower than initially uh, proposed, initially published. Um, and even then that modest effect could have been due, could have been, I'm not saying it was, but could have been due to the unblinded nature of the trial. People knew whether they had one type of therapy or another. And because they were being told, as I think we've just heard, that particular therapies were effective, that influenced their, uh, their reporting of the outcomes. And that's what I'm, I'm saying could have uh, led the impression of a success for a trial, which then influenced the NICE guidelines. Okay. Or the retention of the NICE guidelines. I want to ask both our uh, colleagues who are not members of the Petitions Committee, but here for this particular petition, if they want to either ask a question or make a comment. So Mark first and then Ben. Yeah, th thanks, convener. Um, I wanted to ask you, Emma, about the provision of specialist nursing services um, across Scotland. And I think you mentioned Fife. Uh, I'm not sure if you had access to that, that care and support when you initially um, contracted your condition back in St Andrews. But is it the case that um, NHS boards are, are reluctant to put in place specialist nursing support? Is that the best kind of support and care or, or should it be mainstreamed in a different way? Um, I didn't have access to it. Um, I know that the five patients support the nurse um, and, pardon me, um, could you repeat what else you said? I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Um, yeah, so it's about the, um, the, the provision of that specialist nursing support. Is that something which you think is a model that could and should be used by other other NHS boards to, yes, to, I think to support would be. that? Is that, a night, is that a best practice, in other words? Or? Yes, I think it would, it would be fantastic if there were specialist nurses in every health board um, that could, you know, could, especially as they can give home visits to severe ME patients. And um, again, it's about managing the illness um, early on in diagnosis for the, the best long-term outcome. And uh, definitely, I do think NHS boards are reluctant to um, invest in nurses uh, I think probably because they don't see ME as important. Um, oh. yeah. I think you're, you're probably aware, Mark, that the, the nurse in Fife is completely overwhelmed by um, ME, uh, de dealing the number of patients with ME in, in Fife. Um, so I, th I think we're probably not talking about one specialist nurse per health ward, but you know, funding to provide different, uh, more than one nurse or different types of services for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can I just ask that on, on the back of that? Um, I understand from my constituents in Fife that there is between a 10 and 12 month um, waiting time to be seen by the specialist nurse. Um, so I, I, I wanted to, to just um, really sort of ask you around how do we how do we how do we actually go forward with that? I mean, how do we how do we ensure that? Um, that that specialist support is available across the whole of Scotland. And actually, is that uh, waiting time, is that actually compatible with the Scottish Good Practice Statement? Because my understanding is that in that care pathway, it identifies four months as being an appropriate time to be, to be seen. So, um, you know, 10 to, 10 to 12 months would suggest that 
that that specialist advice isn't isn't kicking in nearly early as it perhaps needs to? Yeah, I mean, it definitely needs to be. Uh, again, sorry, I know I've already said this, but good management advice as soon as possible, like the four months suggested in the Scottish Good Practice Guidelines, is essential in possibly helping to stop deterioration, but definitely for hopefully long term improvement. And um, yeah, I think the answer is probably more investment in nurses. Um, and yeah, I. I there is evidence that the prevalence is about one in 200 individuals. There are plenty of other disorders at that prev level of prevalence. And so I would suggest that whatever is in place currently for diseases of this severity at that level of prevalence is put in place very soon for this disorder. Okay. Professor? Thank you very much, convener. Janet and Emma, I've been uh, working with you over the last two years to assist you as your, your constituency MSP and it's been striking to me not just the, the leadership and, and courage that you've both shown as campaigners but how widespread the campaign is in Scotland to take forward action on this issue in disease and, 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 and the stigma and discrimination and, and blame as you described it Emma that you've felt um, and to overcome that and how my first question would be, how, how important do you think it is that institutions like the Scottish Parliament continue to focus more attention on AME in order to get past the stigma that there's been in the past and to make sure that we do have those changes in investment and attention in, the, in terms of healthcare provision and advancement in, in the way that AME is educated in our in our healthcare training systems. Um, yes, I think I think it's absolutely critical. Um, as I think we've outlined the reasons why we desperately need help for people with ME in Scotland and it's very clear that uh, without I think without the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government taking action, other other we're not expecting the Scottish Parliament to do everything. Um, you know, other organisations will then hopefully be encouraged to come in um, and, and support through funding, research and, and, and so on. But we need somebody to take a lead in Scotland and I think as the comments on, our, on Emma's petition showed very clearly, this is a chance for Scotland to take a lead, uh, the Scottish Government to take a lead and the Scottish Parliament to take a lead, not just in Scotland but it would be setting an example t to the rest of the world, um, you know, it would effectively be saying, look, we are, we are a we, we've got a long history of research, of medical research. And we're now going to take a lead in ME research, same with education of, of healthcare professionals and support for patients. Having attended a meeting in Geneva at the World Health Assembly, it is quite clear that many countries around the world have even worse support for individuals with ME than is in this country and in the UK as a whole. Taking a, a lead would help internationally. And as, as one more question, if I may, come here. and and there's. As much as uh, that is absolutely absolutely true in terms of giving us more assistance to, to people with ME in Scotland now, uh, there seems to be with the film unrest and its attention that it got at international film festivals, and there seems to be a worldwide movement and, and mobilisation of those who know about ME or are suffering from ME and care about ME to see action on this and how. I guess I'm trying to emphasise the pertinency of this issue, not just uh, for those who are, who are suffering, but as, as, a, as a, a, a health issue that is at the forefront of, of people's minds at the moment. And thus there is a window of opportunity, but as all windows of opportunity are, they shut. And people will forget these neglected people in time unless action is uh, forthcoming. Okay. Thanks very much. I don't know if there's any last points you want to make, Emma, before we conclude. Thank you. OK. Um, I think that certainly have found that very thought-provoking, and I can thank you very much for your presentation. I wonder if members um, have any comments on how they might want to take this petition forward. Brian? Um, thank you, Gavina. Thank you for giving us evidence today. I think there's two, two things uh, jump out for me in 
obviously, I think there's the lack of research uh, and the research that's required. Um, I, I think that uh, it, there seems to be a, a, a feeling that um, uh, we're, we're talking about attacking energy systems here. We're talking about you know attacking the endocrine system here, and that of, of course that, that sort of biomedical approach that isn't happening at the moment. I think that's something. I'd like to explore. And I think this the, the bad bit for me, the worst bit for me, is that um, the idea that the, our healthcare professionals, uh, there are nice guidelines available there and same guidelines available. And we've heard this before, where where that dissemination of information is not is not um, getting to the front line, and we're not arming our healthcare professionals with enough knowledge of how to to tackle uh, to tackle uh, conditions. And and this is uh, one of those conditions. Um, I, th I think that uh, ME until not that long ago uh, used to be branded as sort of yupp yuppie flu. I think we've all um, we've all uh, had casework uh, uh, that, that has has, uh, has has moved us, and, and that's why I'm particularly glad that this petition is here. I, I wonder whether, in first instance, we should be writing to the government to seek the views and the actions called for in this petition around that idea of of increasing research and around that idea of disseminating that information you know, to the healthcare professionals around the NICE guidelines. And specifically, I think, around the NICE guidelines, if they're consulting, how they're consulting, but are there things they could be doing currently around good practice instead of waiting to the end of the process? I think we should be asking them about that. Anything else? Rona? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, was, was really struck by your... your, your um, your evidence and, and thank you for bringing this petition. It's really important. I'm sure the 21,000 other ME sufferers thank you as well. Um, the thing that strikes me is that you know it's not. This isn't new. This is not a new condition. And despite all the guidelines and and and, and you know a, initiatives that have been set up, it hasn't really worked. Nothing. Nothing has changed. And I think that's um, it's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable that nothing has changed, and you know uh, I think that this hopefully this petition will kickstart some action from the government and from the medical establishment. So I mean I think as my colleague said, we need to write to the government to to to, to see what action um, to seek views and the action that you're calling for, and to the a wide range of other stakeholders just to you know to, to give us to give us their views, because I think. That this has to be the start of something that's going to di make a difference because so far you, you've been denied that. Yeah. Just like to point, uh, it seems to me that obviously uh, Fife um, uh, are blazing a trail on this one, but um, I, I got the feeling the, f the funding was probably through um, you know um, fundraising, um, perhaps. I, I don't know if I'm right there, but. Uh, I'd like to know what all the NHS boards are currently doing um, and what position we're in um, so that we can get some sort of consistency um, in, in terms of um, how we understand rather than anecdotal uh, kind of evidence. So I think we want to write to the Scottish Government for their views. <clears throat> I do think we want to write to the health boards, as you say, what's the provision across the country. I'm interested in the, <clears throat> the clinical view on treatment that's actually, you know, the petitioner is arguing is harmful, mm. and what is what is the, 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 the medical view in that? And I think we would want, obviously, to write to those organisations who are closest to this round, you know, ME itself, so it's Action for ME. I think we've also been told about ME Research UK, um, the Scottish Public Health Network, and we can maybe reflect with the clerks if there are other groups that would be worth our um, speaking to, and if you have any local groups that you're aware of, that you professionally are aware of, that you think would be worthwhile our seeking submissions from, then um, we can do that, but obviously anybody who's interested in this field can also submit on the petition um, on our petitions page as well. I don't know if there are any other suggestions that we we have. There seems to be quite a lot to be going on with. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In that case, there's quite a substantial piece of work to be done there, and can I um, thank you very much um, for your attendance and providing such thought-provoking evidence. Um, and I'm now going to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table.
can um, call the meeting back to order and we move to the next petition for consideration, which is petition um, 1695 by Ben and Evelyn Mundell on access to justice in Scotland. And can I welcome David Stewart, the MSP, to the table for this item. This is a new petition that was lodged without collecting signatures or comments. The petition calls for action to be taken to ensure that people are able to access justice, including access to legal advice from appropriately trained lawyers and financial support through legal aid. The petition asks for these to be available so that people in Scotland can pursue cases where they consider human rights breach to have occurred. Members will note that the background information provided for us highlights that Mr and Mrs Mundell have previously petitioned to Parliament in relation to issues arising from the EU milk quotas and ring fencing policies. While the background information to this petition sets out some detail on that issue, the focus is on questions of accessing legal advice. The petition contends that specific issues people may face in ac accessing such advice include the Law Society of Scotland's list of firms undertaking human rights cases is out of date, there is a lack of lawyers in Scotland who are willing to take on human rights cases, the law firms that are willing to take on human rights work will only do so if paid large sums up front and will not consider such work on a legal aid basis. Edward Mountain MSP has provided some comments on this petition and I quote, I was approached by two constituents, Ben and Evelyn Mundell. As I have a background in farming, I would like to refer the committee and the convener to my register of interest regarding this. The situation was that the Scottish Government took action to protect the milk industry in their area by ring fencing their milk quota to the locale. This ensured that local milk processor, processors stayed in business but prevented normal trade. The ability to lease or sell milk quota that was open to farmers in other parts of Scotland and the UK. Mr and Mrs Mundell also believed their business was destroyed as a processor could offer a low price for their milk knowing the quota could not be traded. The government did consult on the ring fencing before it was implemented but failed to consult with individual producers who legally owned the quota and furthermore they took an inconsistent approach to Kintyre than they did across the rest of Scotland. Mr and Mrs Mundell feel that their human rights have been compromised. The issue that is due to the the fact that legal advice using legal aid is not available for human rights violations and they cannot afford the massive costs involved and um, thus they cannot challenge the government's actions. The petition based on their experiences is to widen legal aid to include human rights violations which I support when the actions that cause this are undertaken by a government. I would ask the committee to consider this further perhaps write to the government request and comment on this potential human rights issue. And that's the end of the quote from um, Edward Mountain. I wonder if I maybe bring in David Stewart at this point to um, indicate his involvement and then we can reflect on what we've heard. Uh, thank you very much, Kavina. Can I thank the committee for allowing me to uh, support the petition from the Medell family? Just a little bit of background. Um, I've been involved with the family for several years, uh, but also like to place on record my thanks to previous members who supported uh, the family, not least uh, Jimmy McGregor and uh, Peter Peacock. And obviously, I would thank Edward Mountain for his work as well. And as you know, the family are in the gallery today. Um, this is a highly complicated case, uh, but it's well summarised in the accompanying papers which you've uh, uh, um, outlined. On the surface, it's about the ring fencing of milk quotas for the dairy farmers, particularly, but not exclusively, within the Southern Isles ring fenced areas. But the deeper and fundamental issue is how an ordinary Scottish family on a modest income can seek redress and remedy to potential breaches of the European Convention of Human Rights and Justice in general. Now, the simplistic answer, convener, is to seek legal representation through the Civil Legal Aid uh, Scheme. The family have been touched with more than 50 lawyers, either in person or by phone. And the vast majority, the family tell me, uh, will not deal with human rights cases. And those that do reported they will only deal uh, with prisoners or those who've got uh, an immigration issue. To give you one example, uh, one lawyer who agreed to take the case wanted £25,000 in upfront payment uh, before proceeding. Now, this sum represents double the family's disposable yearly income. Uh, Mr and Mrs Medell met me in Parliament yesterday. Uh, they told me that many farmers in the ring-fenced areas were placed in an impossible situation 
with a milk price below the cost of production, the forfeit of their property, which, um, as outlined in the report, is a breach of Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, no money to pay interest on the perfectly healthy cows. Sorry, no, no money uh, to pay interest on, on their overdraft and having to incinerate perfectly healthy cows at less than £500 per head. No money to diversify, severe stress and, in some cases, a loss of home and business. Now, this new is not just about one family, much as the Mandels are in a terribly tragic position. It's about how you right a wrong. Surely the test of any advanced democratic society is how easily and transparent you can seek legal redress at the highest level. And if I, I may summarise, convener, I had three uh, suggestions. Obviously, it's the committee's decision, uh, not mine. But I would certainly suggest writing to the Scottish Government and the Law Society of Scotland to seek views in the actions called for in the petition. Um, as I think recommended, seems very sensible. Um, also, and perhaps unusually, uh, the petition could be referred to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee uh, so that petitioners could provide evidence because they are, as you know, carrying out an inquiry in this particular area. Um, for information only, it would probably be useful to pass uh, the petition to the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership since they are looking at that um, as we speak. And finally, could I uh, thank the committee uh, for listening to my representations this morning. I do appreciate it's, it's very complicated, but the key issue uh, I would stress is access to human rights at a very senior level uh, where families have limited funding. That, that's the key, and it's quite r rightly uh, agree with Edwin Mighton's point. I think there's been a fundamental miscarriage of justice, which has effectively and almostly run this family into bankruptcy, along with many other farmers in this area as well. Okay. Thanks very much for that. I think that is very helpful. A dilemma for us as a committee, um, given that the Equality and Human Rights Committee are taking evidence, if we do that, if we refer it, we would not then be able to take any other action. So it may be that we need, we need to think about that, but I'd be sure. interested in other members' comments and what we can do. Um, Rachel? Um, I mean, if it, would it be um, permissible for the family to give evidence to that committee I'm being informed that the evidence is now closed and the committee is considering its draft report in private today. So it may be that that report, actually, once we see that, might inform some of the action around this petition, but we're not going to be able to do it the other way around. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Um, thank you. I think, um, I think this is a very good example. That, that, that this does seem to highlight uh, a, a flaw, a gap in the law. It's, it's my understanding that the Law Society are reviewing their own legal aid rules currently uh, as well. So I, th I do agree with writing to the Scottish Government and, and the Law Society uh, of Scotland to seek their views on, on the, the actions that are called for on the petition because I think there's already work being done on this. And it would, if nothing else, it may also help to inform that review. Okay. Rona? I agree, I agree with that. I mean, I think we we should write to the government highlighting the petition and the law society to, to have their um, have their their take on it as a first step. Yep. And we we'll, we will take a note of what the the report from the Equality Human Rights Committee says on on this question. Um, I actually would be interested, and in I know it's it said very explicitly that um, lawyers won't take these cases unless they're paid up front, and I just wonder whether. We could maybe ask the law society whether there are examples of good practice where people don't do that. Is that the, the is that what everybody does, or it's just what almost everybody does, or what the kind of the balance is would be yeah. worthwhile knowing about? Yeah, I think that's a good point, um, Convener. Could just stress, uh, you know, for the record, obviously in Scotland there are uh, a great deal of expertise um, among the legal profession on human rights. I'm not disputing that in any way. The issue is to get that expertise and the provision of legal aid together is some is extremely difficult. And as I stressed earlier, the family went round 50 lawyers and I did pass a very helpful paper from Spice to them. So they went in with this with their, eye, with their eyes open. It's extremely difficult to access justice at the higher level when you're on a relatively modest income. So that is the real dilemma. Anything law society to do to facilitate that would be very useful. And do we know whether the Scottish Human Rights Commission has done anything around this? Um, certainly they, they're an organisation with lots of expertise and certainly if you, the committee wanted to refer uh, that to them as well, I would certainly welcome that. It would be interesting what their view was. That would be interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, David also made the point that he wanted to um, 
ask the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership about this, and, and I wondered whether that we, we should um, submit it to them too. The issue and see if they get a response from that as well. Okay, so I think we recognise um, the strength of representations from both Edward Mountain and, and David Stewart, and we certainly want to at least explore the extent to which this is a gap in the system for people who feel that, that their human rights have been violated and what support we have for those human rights, um, for the enforcement of people's access to human rights and, and um, justice in that regard. Um, and also this will be a, a, a petition that will come back to the committee and we will keep the petitioners um, informed of what submissions we receive and they will be able to provide a further submission once we've heard those responses. So can I thank you, David, for your attendance? And thank and you again and the committee members for listening to me. Thank you. And thank the petitioners for um, their petition too and it's one that we would look at further. With that, can I... Uh, close the meeting and we're now going to move into a private session.